Hello and welcome to my lecture. My name is uh, Dr. Shiraz Khan and I'm going to be talking about anterior and posterior adhesive aesthetics. So what we're talking about is composite and resin technology. Um, I want to say a big thank you to the Akshaya Patra Foundation and particularly Ajay who has invited me to come and speak over these coming webinars. Hopefully you find it helpful and um, there's a fantastic lineup of speakers so I'm incredibly honoured and privileged to be part of it. So let's discuss the learning objectives. What I want to talk about is, is adhesive dentistry and the relevance of isolation. So rubber dam um, being applicable in restorative and adhesive dentistry, more importantly. I want to just demonstrate some posterior and anterior composite workflow with some optimizations of techniques. And to finish off, I'll discuss a bit of resin infiltration therapy and how you can use that to optimize outcomes for patients. I want to give a big thank you to the uh, Young Dentist Academy who have hugely supported my growth knowledge and, and, and sort of dental well-being, if you can, within the field of dentistry. Again, the Akshay and Patra Foundation for all their great work. So I'm honoured to be part of it. And also LCIAD Academy, who are the practice I work with, which I'll talk about in a moment, and uh, their support and being involved in their programme. <clears throat> so also I want to give a big thank you to these two legends in the UK, in the in the UK dentistry game, um, Tiff Groshi, who's a revolutionary, who's changed the uh, approach from, from perhaps more aggressive forms of preparation to minimally invasive aesthetics. And also Lewis McKenzie, that's a, a long time friend, but also was my clinical tutor when I was an undergraduate at university. Furthermore, um, Corey Ferran, who's the uh, owner and clinical director of LCIED, which is on Wimpole Street. And finally, my international friends, Walter Devoto, Anna Salat and Jordi Manata, um, for their support in my development. So where I work, I'm currently working on 28 Wimpole Street in the majority of my time in the week. Um, but I also work in Devonshire Place at 11. And I'm very fortunate to be um, working in, in Chelsea and Fulham Dentist, which is a lovely little family-run practice um, in, in Fulham. I was very... Very fortunate to have been offered and, and completed a, a master's in restorative dentistry. Um, we'll talk about whether a master's is the right thing for you or whether you should consider, you know, other av avenues of, of education. But for me at the time, this was the ideal route for, for my career progression and development. Disclosure, uh, some people may or may not know I'm part, I'm the clinical director of Sculpt, which is a home-based composite training platform that allows you to use, do hands-on whilst following on, on, on videos, whether that's live or on through our uh, website portal. So um, if anyone wants more information, you can contact me directly. So I'm very, very fortunate to have been shortlisted and won some awards, uh, which make for a fantastic evening out. We get dressed up. Um, and go on stage and look like you've uh, you're you're a bit too excited, but yeah, it's a, a lovely opportunity to ballpark your sort of um, progression with regards to the, the the UK UK dental climate. So it's it's a good way to to sort of ballpark how you're doing. Um, but I'm very very honoured to be part of that. So my daily dentistry composes of majority of uh, composite restorations, whether that's anterior. Or, uh, sorry, if that's posterior, anterior, whether we're doing resin infiltration uh, or whether we're cementing, you know, Emacs restorations. Adhesive dentistry makes up a big part of what I do day to day. So I'm still doing endodontic treatment. I wouldn't say it's my forte per se. However, it's something that I still do on a relatively regular basis. Um, you know, here's a case that was referred to me by one of my colleagues at the practice to, to, to section remove a crown. It was irreversibly pulpitic. There was a, a carious core, so we had to get everything nice and clean. Air braid, create a, a solid core, root treat, and post and, and build up build up the tooth. Um, so I'm not an endodontist by any means, but endodontic treatment, I think, is very, very important to have that as a skill because we need to be able to offer care to those who, who may you know, have endodontic origin issues, irrespective of our you know, day-to-day -day practice is going to be composite or, or, or something else. Uh, ultimately, I still do indirect restorative dentistry, which uh, is replacement is more likely a replacement event. I'm doing uh, a lot more implant-related restoration work now. Um, so here's a case where we, this patient had this crown for several years. Um, it had done extremely well, but the patient just wasn't happy with the way it looked. So it's the upper left two, and what we've been able to do is just create a more symmetrical upper left two, trying to play with the line angles, etc. I've been doing more and more full full occlusal reorganization cases 
whereby the patient has been breaking everything to trying to be able to create some sort of posterior support and then transfer those to definitive restorations. Um, in that case, we actually used composite, but I'm also doing more interdisciplinary prosthetics, so replacement of bridge work for implant-related work. Um, when there are teeth that have got a poor prognosis, um, which need removal, how we can optimise the outcome for that sort of patient. And also, I'm doing more and more ortho-restorative-based work. Um, which would include, you know, this patient who had these chipping of her incisors, the two central incisors were tilted inwards, there was a constricted anterior envelope, and by moving the teeth to the ideal position, brightening the teeth, we were able to provide canine guidance on excursions, protected, mutually protected dentition, uh, disclusion on, on anterior uh, protrusion, um, and ultimately it, and a healthier smile. As you know, we should be using rub dam for the majority of our procedures, um, including. As you know, we should be using rub dam for a majority of our procedures that include, obviously, endodontic treatment. I think, and um, ensuring that you've got rub dam isolation is a absolute pivotal hallmark in ensuring that we can achieve predictable and safe endodontic outcomes. But also, more and more, I'm using it for most direct, in fact, if not all direct restorations. Um, as you can see, it's a composite that I replaced, and uh, rubber dam just makes your life easier. Um, here's another example, albeit a simple occlusal, but needed um, needed replacement. And um, rubber dam just makes your life easier. More and more I'm doing anterior work, the more, the more simplified my workflow is becoming with rubber dam. Um, it's just making life easier for me, so I ensure that I'm using rubber dam on if not all anterior restorations. And obviously, because we're using indirect cements that are resin retained usually, or resin cements, the technology is the same. So I don't see why we wouldn't consider uh, using rubber dam um, for indirect cementation, particularly if it's adhesive based. And actually this came to me when I was lecturing a patient, had, uh, uh, sorry, a dentist had questioned if I use rubber dam for cementation. The answer at the time was no. And they said to me, actually, if you're using the same technology, why wouldn't you use rubber dam? And I stood up and said, you know, you're absolutely right. And from that point onwards, I've been using rubber dam to cement as well. So here's the only that we're cementing. So isolation, in essence, what is it? There's lots of evidence out there that supports the use of isolation to improve outcomes for um, composite resin restorations, um, in uh, advising that rubber dam is considered the absolute form of isolation and that other things are called relative isolation. But here's the interesting point. Casagero et al. Um, in 2014 pointed out that actually isolation is mandatory for adhesive dentistry, but it's not necessarily that rubber dam is the only way to achieve that isolation. And in fact, what they found was there was no statistically significant um, evidence to support the use of rubber dam in improving clinical outcomes. Um, compared to other types of isolation. Now, what's really interesting is there was a Cochrane review, which I found afterwards, which was actually in 2012 by Wang and colleagues. And what they found was that <laughs> they found many, many papers um, that included rub dam isolation um, for adhesive dentistry. After they uh, you know, used their inclusion criteria, they were only able to identify four papers. So go to PubMed and have a look and type in rubber dam and adhesive dentistry and you'll find thousands of results but this paper was only able to include four papers uh, and what did they find out those four papers well there was still a high risk of bias there's no clear improvement in outcomes and rubber dam versus cotton wool roll showed no statistically significant differences in clinical performance okay so so what does all of this mean well a side point which is i'm going to talk about icon in a moment uh, later on in this talk I think ICON users must use rubber dam because we're using 50%, 15% hydrochloric acid. So I'll talk to you about this later, but we don't want that sitting on the soft tissues in any way, shape or form. So like I said, when I'm doing anterior bonding, it just provides a clearer working field um, without any complications. Um, it just makes your, your bonding protocol much simpler, much more straightforward. Now, often people talk about rubber dam inversion. What this is, is being able to tuck the rubber dam sort of reflect it back into the tooth so that you're not going to get any spurious fluid release. And what I tend to use is this fantastic acorn shaped instrument, which ultimately allows you 
to feed the reflect the rubber dam in on itself to create a relative seal. And the way you do that, as this picture demonstrates, is you're going to uh, place the instrument almost longitudinally to the tooth. But the other thing is you have to ensure that your nurse or assistant is appropriately drying the tooth. If you try to do this without the tooth wet, it doesn't reflect very, very well. Um, and that allows you to you know, get this sort of reflection and retraction. Um, when I'm doing anterior cases, I'm always doing premolar to premolar as well. And occasionally there's going to be a need for floss ligatures. So that's, here's a case where we're doing composite veneers. We've had to do some interproximal uh, caries clearance in between the centrals. And when you use floss ligatures, you expose more tooth surface, which is absolutely imperative for composite veneers. Um, appropriate hole sizing. I'm sure you guys are aware of this, but the clamps that you, or the punches that you use have multiple holes and they designate to different teeth. If I'm going to be clear, I tend to use the clamp tooth size for the tooth that's obviously clamped and the lower incisor. They're the only sizes I use by and large. Um, I want the, you know, in, in a sense, I want it to be as taut as it can be around the tooth. So I use the smallest hole size and that gives us reflection. Um, you can use templates to create hole positioning. I think it's a fantastic tool, but remember it's only applicable for really well aligned arches. So I don't tend to use that. I tend to do customized hole positioning. So if you look at this arch, although relatively, relatively well aligned, there's still some anterior crowding. So what I'll do is I'll put the rubber dam on the, on the teeth. I'll put a dot on all of the teeth, the central points of all of the teeth, and then I'll sort of put those holes on, on the rubber dam. Now, if you were to draw the ideal arch form over that, you'll find that they don't quite fit. And to get that really snug fit around the um, rubber dam and to create that seal, you need that spacing and the smallest hole sizing to be, to be used. So what are the pros benefits to rubber dam? Here I've been talking about that. First, I started with saying that rubber dam isolation is not going to give you statistically significantly improved outcomes. And now I'm sitting there saying, well, actually it helps you. Now the proposed benefits for rubber dam is that it improves patient safety. So nothing's gonna fall down the patient's throat. Um, <laughs> patient communication, that doesn't mean trying to speak to them whilst they've got rubber dam on. Um, it's more of a, a, a communication tool to show why we use rubber dam and what it protects their, their airway and so on. Um, I think it allows for clinical reflection because it's easier to take interim treatment shots because you're not worried about isolation or leakage or, or, or anything like that. But in, in, imperatively, I think the visibility is hugely improved. You remove all the, the distractions, the soft tissue, the tongue, whatever it may be, and you're just looking at teeth. So I think it's incredibly um, valuable in, in removing distraction for the mind and the brain. Um, Medico legal, well, there's not been a successful case to show that someone hasn't used rubber dam and, and, and achieved a suboptimal outcome. And I don't think that will ever exist. But um, in favor, invariably, if you've taken the time to you know place down and you've done things as best as you can, you've taken photos of each step, that's a great medico legal record. Uh, and invariably, um, those that tend to publish rubber um, sort of composite cases, etc., you usually are done so under rubber dam. And there's lots of evidence actually to support the use of, of, of uh, rubber dam. And this is an incredible, incredible article by Aman and colleagues, um, which was done in 2012. And what they showed was that the, um, the perceived stress by a patient um, using rubber dam is significantly reduced. So because the, 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 the what they suggested, because there's a physical sheet that there's, that's giving sensory information back to the cortex. Invariably, that sensory information might be blocking some of the nociception or, or pain reception uh, from the teeth. So in this case, what they did is they did people who needed PRRs or, or fissure sealants right and left, but only needed a fissurectomy, not caries clearance, just a fissurectomy. And on the right side, they'll do it without uh, rubber dam. On the left side, they'll do it with rubber dam. Now, there's lots of variables involved here, but invariably they found that the side that the rubber dam was used, um, the patient perceived less pain. Now that's a very interesting thought, isn't it? Because um, they also found that the dentist for restoration placement was also less stressed. Now, invariably, you're going to be more stressed putting it down if it's difficult isolation, etc. But I just thought it was a really interesting study to show how rubber dam can be used successfully um, and it improves outcomes for patients. Now, back to uh, Berglund and the colleagues, and this is, a, this is a relatively old paper, actually, in 1997, that showed that actually you'll get, if you're removing an amalgam, you'll get a peak plasma uh, urinary uh, mercury output, which takes approximately a year to last. So 
to, 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 to level. So um, the removal of, of amalgam, which is going to happen in our lifetimes invariably for whatever reason, creates a mercury vapour, which is far more dangerous than the amalgam being locked in the lattice, the alloy lattice. So protecting the airway with a high speed aspiration rubber dam and slower aspiration outside the rubber dam has been shown to to um, significantly improve those outcomes. So again, here's another reason for why rubber dam is, is, is good to use. But the perceived barriers, and again, there's various papers that prove these things. People think it's time consuming. It's the people that are, that are using it that don't really like it probably don't get along with it because there's relative low experience. They say that the patients have claustrophobia to it. Now, I've had one patient in, I mean, in my uh, eight years of practice that absolutely could not cope with rubber dams. So we had to change our restorative material. Um, but she has, you know, very significant phobia and fears. So, you know, I can say that has happened. Um, it's technique sensitive, so people might not use the right sized holes. They might put the teeth, the, the spacing holes might be too close together and they'll still get um, saliva ingress. Um, a lot of people think it's unnecessary, uh, which as papers show, there isn't an improvement of clinical outcomes. So what are we really doing it for? Um, and I think the others that, that also don't advocate it may not have um, been able to use it enough to subsequently improve their workflow with it. Okay, so I've covered rubber dam now. So I've covered rubber dam to, to allow you to understand why I think it's a good idea to use in practice. But I think what's more important is talking about cases and how we can optimize the workflow. So here's some, some, some cases that can demonstrate posterior restoration. So I'll start with a class one, which is really, really nice and simple. So a patient comes in, they've obviously got caries. Um, what we need to do is be able to remove the caries in a minimal way. Um, I, I tend to like air abrading the um, cavities because I think it just creates a cleaner substrate. Um, um, and then we'll restore with composite resin. So it's very, very simple. I decided in the end to apply some fissure, fissure characterization. Is it needed? Absolutely not. Um, probably overdone it in this case, frankly. Um, but what it does is for allows for a well-integrated restoration that invariably is 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 um, not going to create any interferences in occlusion, static or dynamic. Now we've got a significant wear case here where we were building up all of the place areas with lots of caries and this poor young lady, um, lovely lady, um, you know, has a very, very bright future ahead of her, but in her late twenties and had had quite severe episodes of anxiety when she was younger, which had you know, invariably destroyed her teeth. So what we needed to do is be able to build up the shape and the cusp of the teeth. We had done some wax ups, and et cetera. And um, the idea was to, to, you know, give some sort of posterior stability again. So what we've done is removed all the decay, removed all the existing restorations, got everything clean, aerobraded, etched the surfaces. Um, I don't do just selective etch, actually. I do I do enamel and MT and etch because I was using Optimon DFL. Um, and then what we're going to do is, is build up the increments. So here is an example of the cusp by cusp method. So I'm restoring cusp by cusp ensuring that I'm getting to the ideal anatomy and then I added some physical characterization to to highlight highlight the the the, the fissure pattern for me. Um do I need do you need to do this not really? Um this is purely purely well th there is one added benefit ultimately if there are any in inherent voids that you've created in your restoration they get sealed off by the 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 flowable um chromatic brown chromatic resin but invariably it's it's just a preference um to restorations. Now here I've got a case where I um, um, uh, do something called the fissure modeling technique. So I'll leave this on the screen for a moment for you guys to watch. So what we've done here is we've, we've restored all of the, um, the layers that are going to be in the dentine. And we finish off by putting one final layer for the occlusal surface. So in regards to contraction, shrinkage and stress, that it doesn't really exist because it's only a two millimeter increment. So you're not gonna get cusp deflection because all the other parts have been done in appropriate, in appropriate layers. And what we're doing is we're in essence drawing out the fissure pattern, okay? So you're using it as a sewing machine type, type uh, instrument and you need to use a relatively sharp probe for doing this and you know the, the fissure the fissure pattern we already kind of have an understanding of where it is and what we do is we just try and draw that pattern in 
Okay, so you just refine any fissures, you're taking any excess off, and, and marginal excess is something that often is it creates a you know a big issue. So trying to clear that up as much as you can. Um, and then what we're gonna invariably do is we're gonna use a micro brush to be able to 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 sort of push the the material where it needs to go. So we're gonna close the fissures up slightly, we're going to um, remove any excess invariably. Um, and as you can see, very, very nicely and slowly, you're just starting to create the ideal fissure pattern. When you choose to start wanting to include some secondary anatomy, you can just start adding little, very, very faint grooves into the teeth. Sometimes I like using uh, modeling brushes just to get rid of any excess. Um, I think it works incredibly well. Um, I think it gives um, you know an, a better ability to adapt. But the other thing that I tend to tend to like using as well, which is going to come in a moment, is the use of um, the use of an endo file. So I'm just going to be bringing it in very very shortly. But what you can see is as you start blending the bits together, the fissure anatomy starts getting a bit lost. So by using an endo file, you're able just to redefine those fissures ever so slightly. And very very gently I mean they don't have to be too far but it just allows for just a bit more definition in those fissures so and you know this was taught to me by a fantastic colleague from Italy um, to, to get that excess bit of, of definition between the uh, appropriate increments um, using an ender file works incredibly well so I hope that's helpful so it gives you an insight on how I restore my posteriors Let's talk about exactly the opposite end. Let's talk about a class five. Now, class fives are incredibly difficult. When you're using rubber dam, it's, in, it's incredibly difficult to try and get isolation. But I, I, this picture means a lot on, on many folds because what it does is it's called slave clamping or accessory clamping. So in essence, what you're going to do is you're going to rubber dam isolate from the, the I don't know, the seven to the one on, in that quadrant. And then you can use an additional clamp to get some additional retraction of aid soft tissue, um, but also the dam. Um, this isn't uh, the clamp that I use all the time. I prefer something called soft tissue retractors or the uh, the um, B4 Brinker clamps, which work incredibly well um, to get that just final push of the, the tissues. But um, it allows for perfect isolation, and you can build up the restoration relatively, you know, stress free. So class twos, class twos are the one that always come into contention when I'm teaching courses. People are always asking about, uh, are you going to be covering class two restorations? And I think class twos are very, very important. Here we've got this premolar, which you can see the shadowing on the dentine. And the, the, the amount of caries is far deeper than it looks. And this is called a cult carry, so there's no obvious point of entry. But clearly there is caries underneath. So what we're going to do is we're going to, to start at just mesial to the marginal ridge, start clearing out. I tend to use protection on the adjacent tooth to avoid there being any damage nick the rubber down there slightly anyway. Once we've changed the rubber down, we're going to um, place our uh, matrix and we're going to place something called a sectional band. Now what this sectional band is doing, it's applying a compressive force to the teeth. Okay, so it's compressing the teeth. So every um, Newton's law of physics, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So as you're pressing the teeth together, the teeth themselves are separating. Okay, so the teeth are separated. What this then does is create a wider, so if you can see that, the teeth separate slightly, which creates a wider contact area that the tooth needs to create. So that once you take this band off, the teeth will ping together and it's been restored to a widened area. Yeah. And what will happen is as the teeth ping back together, you take off your matrix, you'll always have pretty much a close contact, almost always. So now it becomes a class one again. So you build up the different layers get the enamel dentine, give it a polish, and there you are. That's the rest restoration immediately afterwards. Almost doesn't even look like we've been there. Um, and there's lots of evidence out there. You know, Sabre and colleagues wrote a fantastic paper on the use of the evaluation of proximal contacts using sectional and circumferential matrices. And they found every day of the week that if you can get adequate support using a sectional matrix, it will always give a better contact point. Um, so here you can use... Uh, you know, mesial and distal on the same tooth at the same time. And again, this is relatively well covered by Penner and colleagues, which is in the British Dental Journal in 2016. It's a step-by-step -step process on how to use sectional matrices. So it's a fantastic paper. Um, I'd recommend it if you don't know how to use them. 
Um, you know, you can do multiple restorations at the same time. Um, what if you've got rubbed down on, obviously, but also with with uh, interproximal restorations. Here's another one that I've done that was published in 2018. Um, but there's a there's a there's a wide range wide range of matrices out there that will ultimately allow for you to restore proximal uh, areas. I tend to find sectional better because the for the compressive. The, the creation of that compressive element allows for slight separation, which allows for a tighter contact to be formed. Invariably, there's no separation here. Um, and also, the um, maximum bulbosity of a restoration is not at the marginal ridge. It's usually a third of the way down. So what I don't want is the, the most proximal part to be the most superficial or, or coronal part of the restoration. And I feel like sectional matrices have, have, have managed that really, really well. So that was a brief introduction to class two restorations. I wanted to go to anterior restorations because I think that's what people like to see. So I thought I'd start with something really, really basic, which is class two restorations, possibly the most basic in terms of layering, but sometimes the most difficult element to, to restore because creating um, the appropriate matrix, creating the appropriate co contour interproximally can be really, really challenging. But if you take your time and you've got good isolation, um, you are able to restore the teeth relatively predictably without a huge amount of overhangs. Let's talk about a class wall. So this is what's most common. So this is a really small class wall. Incidentally, this was a dentist's uh, fiance who tracked me down and said, please, could you please could you help my 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 fiance has had an accident so we've seen the the kind of the teeth i took a pre-op shade and realized that wow we're whiter than b1 so we're going to have to use the whiter shade in the armatarium and what we're going to do is trial a few shades on the teeth see which ones work obviously rubber down isolate um ensure we've got adequate retraction and reflection um and and basically understand the extent of the lesion uh i've, I've aerobated actually i've etched um I've created the palatal element freehand because I didn't have anything that ultimately, um, there wasn't an edge there before. So we've done this freehand, we've done the sort of the palatal uh, enamel, I've added some dentine, and then I finished up with some labial enamel. And that's the immediate immediate result when we finished. I realized that was probably slightly too long, so I adjusted, so that was pre, that's post. So again, the patient feels relatively comfortable in allowing their that, you know, themselves to smile without any issue. Now, composite veneers is a contentious subject. I know a lot of people that may or may not be watching think it's either the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. I think there's a place for composite veneers. I think there's a place for edge bonding, as Tiff Qureshi has taught me. If you can get the teeth to the right place, most people, most patients' teeth actually look very, very nice. They just need subtle enhancement. So I tend to favor when I'm doing orthodontic cases, uh, edge bonding if possible. Um, but there are lots of people out there that are able to get fantastic outcomes. And ultimately, there are lots of patients out there, but there is no other option. Yeah. So, you know, this is an example where I had to replace a composite, replace composite veneers because the patient didn't want ortho, quite simply. So here's this patient, a young lady, 29 years old. And she comes to me, she says, I hear you do, do composite stuff was her words i was like yeah kind of i have an understanding of it so we take we you know we take some uh, take our initial examination take some photos take some x-rays understand what's going on uh, we got the patient to whiten their teeth so we understood where we were going to be in this composite trying is, is really important for my workflow because i can already get a gauge before the teeth have de uh, sorry uh, you know uh, lost all their water content or with the rubber dam um, dehydrated i can understand how good it's likely to look so we and for those that have ever tried this removal of composite veneers is exceedingly difficult it's so challenging because it's quite difficult to gauge when you're getting to tooth and when you're getting to when you're still in restoration um rest assured we were able to um, remove all the existing composite um, not without losing any tooth structure because invariably we are going to touch the tooth somewhat but we want to minimize that as much as possible so um, this patient had interproximal caries. As you can tell, this was the case that I initially showed with rubber dam retraction. Because it's veneers, we need as much exposure as we can of the cervical surface. Um, there was caries interproximally, so we've got rid of that. And then invariably, we're ready to start the bonding process. So we etch. And here is how I use uh, posterior matrices to restore anterior teeth. So these are posterior matrices put up the long axis of the tooth to create the ideal curvature, if you want to call it that. So what we do is place them in. I wanted to build up my dentine increments first. So I placed all the dentine 
um, using these matrices to start. Um, ensure I use a brush to get adapt, uh, appropriate adaptation and modeling. And then we apply um, the, the, the sort of uh, labial increment in one go. On the first visit, what I'll tend to do is give some rough anatomy as to where I think I want the sulci and you know certain developmental grooves to be. And then I'm going to leave the patient. I want to make sure there's no overhangs. I want to make sure there's nothing that's absolutely rough. And then I'm going to leave the patient. The patient's tired. My eyes have probably got tired. I'll call them back for a review in one week. Um, so this is how they leave the surgery. And already she was relatively happy. She comes back to the practice a week later. I'm fresh, she's fresh. And what we're going to do is we're going to start polishing these a bit further. So what we do is um, use a various uh, combination of soft flex discs, astral pole polishing points, and um, sometimes a diamond core script burr and uh, a felt wheel of some nature, just to be able to polish the teeth a bit more. And once we're finished, as you can see, the luster has gone up. Um, the anatomy that we've created is still there and the effect of the dentine shining through is also still there. So it works really, really well. And here's a close up and showing how glossy we can get the tooth surface to look. Um, and invariably, you know, a year down the line, the restorations are still looking fantastic. There's probably a slight overhang in the mesial of the upper, upper left one, which I noted, polished, and it had improved things. So we're getting to some things that are a little bit more complicated now. So a patient who has missing uh, lateral incisors and the canines have been moved forward as in this case. So this is a challenging case from the get-go. What you'll what be interested to know is the patient has deciduous C's, but also they've gone through orthodontics for about seven to eight years um, at a very reputable hospital in London. So this is where they've got to. This is as far as they can go without having surgery. And that was what the patient wished for. So we've got these two, two centrals and, and, and canines. Now the patient and the parent, and this patient's 17 years old, and he's going to university in six weeks' time. What can we do? Well, we'll try our best, but we can't guarantee anything as per usual. We decide to uh, uh, get some wax ups made because this is something I'm absolutely going to need a wax up for and get them back to show them what the wax ups could look like. If this is something that they would likely want to go ahead with, we can progress from there. And remember, consent is something that's dynamic and you always need to be, you, you always need to have it at the front of your mind. If a patient's going to go through such relatively serious or comprehensive treatment, they need to know what it's going to look like at the end. So again, composite button trying, it's a familiar story, isn't it? Um, what we're going to use, rubber dam, get rid of any uh, any sort of um, pellicle and so on. Um, we can use floss ligatures because, again, I want as much uh, labial surface free as possible. And the way I get rid of the pellicle is using a, a profi paste, uh, sorry, a profi brush without any paste. Often if these pastes contain any oil, that will sit on the surface and it inhibits our bonding protocol. So I'll air abrade and I'll etch so that I've got a good surface to work with. We will plow our adhesive resin. And we can use our palatal stent to understand what the palatal contour of the restoration is going to be. So we create the palatal shell. And here I'm going to show you a different matrix. So here's the palatal shells on the upper right three and upper left three. And here we're using the Unica matrix, which is done by Polydentia. Fantastic matrix system. And what it does, is you can see, it's pre-curved to the appropriate size or shape for anterior teeth. It works incredibly well. And what it allows you to do is um, contour your restoration really, really um, uh, respecting the natural curves within dentistry. Sometimes the thing I don't like about my last strips is you get a very straight interproximal contour and that's not what teeth are like. And as you can see, once you've used these matrices, you can get a fantastic outline of what you want the teeth to look like. So you've done the uh, sort of shell. You're then going to apply your dentine increments. You're going to follow that with a final enamel increment. And that's the pre-op. And that was one week post up once we've polished everything. Pre and post. So I've used different lighting here to show you that it's not the just fancy lighting that's making the restorations look glossy. It's really relatively well integrated. And patients over the moon, you know, they, they got compliments on, on how great their teeth look, which was something they never could have imagined for the last, you know, 10 years of their life. So I was really, really privileged to be part of that journey with the patient. So... We're at the last leg of this lecture, which is about resin infiltration. And um, ICON has been about for, for quite some time now, but it's a fantastic tool that we add to our armatarium to be able to manage white spot lesions. Now, as per everything, there's no one shoe size fits all. 
um, with, with most things clinically, there's going to be an adjunctive approach to many, many aspects. But I wanted to share this case because it really shows the power of how ICON works. This patient was a 28-year-old female who had gone to a practice within central London and was quoted a very, very large sum for ceramic veneers on all of her upper and lower teeth. Now, there's many things I disagree with, uh, and, and there is a place for ceramic veneers. We do them on the occasions that it's needed. Um, but invariably, um, this is not a case that I believe ceramic veneers are going to work for the patient. So we have a discussion, and um, the patient's like, what can we do? Well, ultimately, we have to diagnose what the issue is. And the, the aesthetic concerns from the patient's perspective is that there are these very florid white spots and translucencies on the teeth, and the teeth are relatively unaligned. So what we're going to start off with, and thank you, for Dr. Santos Patel from the IAS Academy for providing this image. We're going to start with pre-restorative orthodontics. So we're going to get the teeth into the right position to start with. And already, the patient was much happier and much more comfortable with their smile just by the teeth being in the right position. Okay, so what we're going to do is put, whenever you do ICON, you want to brighten the teeth as logic would define and as Linda Greenwell has also quite clearly defined in 2016. The best way to mask white spots is to whiten the substrate surrounding the white spots as much as possible to get an optimal outcome. So we've whitened, and as you can see between the first and last picture, although one's slightly overexposed probably, um, the white spots are looking less obvious. And more importantly, any areas that were brown spots or orange spots have now been converted to white spots and that's key that is absolutely critical for patients who've got trauma or, or, or some sort of damage to the development of the enamel where they won't just have white spots they'll have a combination of white and brown spots convert all the brown spots to white and then try and do icon now i knew from the get-go that this is going to be a case that needs a bit of icon a bit of composite a bit of a bit of everything really um but the patient um understood that it was part of the consent process and what we did was we isolated with rub dam i couldn't get rid of her palatal retainer because she was extremely nervous unfortunately so we had to use some you know um clear clear uh, sorry some uh, liquid dam to 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 protect the gingival areas and we're going to apply the icon resin infiltrant and what you can see is by applying it, it's a 15 percent hydrochloric acid it will erode the surface of the enamel now this is different to microabrasion microabrasion is trying to erode the white spots away what we're trying to do with icon is we're trying to erode the surface of the enamel so that we get access to the top of the white spot so that we can alter its refractive index. What does that mean? Well, it means that white spots bounce light back at you. That's why they look white. Whereas two structure naturally has a little bit of translucency. So there's some that bounces back, but some, a lot of it goes, perfuses through the tooth. And if we can change that refractive index to be more similar to tooth, we can basically make those white spots vanish. Then what we do is, uh, step two is to check with the alcohol, which is 99% ethanol, and it demonstrates what the teeth will look like when they're infiltrated. Now, already after one cycle, we had an improvement actually. Is it enough? No, but is it an improvement? Yes, so we know that we're on the right path. So we repeat this to three or four cycles, and we're not getting much more improvement. So um, we use auxiliary measures. So we use air abrasion in this case, which as Vivek and colleagues found out, it's a fantastic tool in uh, conservative dentistry. And I use it for all of, if not all, but most of my bonding procedures. So we use air abrasion, which is going to take a 27 micrometer aluminum oxide pressure, no more than four bar. And we're going to gently air aerate the surface. We're going to then re-etch. And as you can see, the white spots are starting to disappear more and more we've done another couple of cycles another air abrasion cycle and all of a sudden when we've put our when we've put our um 99 ethanol on the white spits have disappeared and that's fantastic news for us because we know that infiltration is going to work so the resin uh, that we use here is tegma resin and um, it's been shown to have the highest penetration coefficient by comparison comparison to other resins and it's clear so what you're going to do is gently put on like a scrubbing motion onto each tooth for about a minute let it sit for two minutes let it infiltrate into that surface that you've spent time preparing and you're going to remove any excess and you're going to cure each tooth for 40 seconds this isn't the same as normal composite um, or bonding you have to cure for 40 seconds per tooth you're then going to reapply because it's a resin without any filler contraction shrinkage is very very high so what you're going to do is reapply the resin just let it sit for a minute take off any excess and recure again each tooth for 40 seconds so this is a very important picture for me because this shows that all of the white spots have been removed all of the white spots are absolutely gone and 
but we have created erosion defects. So if you look onto the upper left one, upper left two, upper right two, there's a small erosion defect because of the air abrasion and the yes that we've used. So we've applied composite into those eroded areas. We haven't smeared the composite all over the buckle surface. Okay, I've just created a part to sit over the erosion areas. We spend some time polishing that as if it's normal composite, and that's where we get to. So when you look at that before and after, it tells a million words, doesn't it? Before and after. And here's lateral views of the after. So here's before and after. And as you can see, it creates a huge change for the patient. You know, this patient was contemplating some quite relatively destructive dentistry, which she would have been on for the rest of her life. And invariably, as part of our consent process, we said that restorative dentistry at some stage of her life is probably going to be required. But do you know what? If we can get this patient to this position and we can get it to last, if she's seeing a hygienist brushing well twice a day, every day, there's a significant chance that these white spot lesions may remain, they, they may they may have remained, you know, gone for, for, for many, many years. And, you know, the daughter, Martin Keller always talks about the daughter test. Absolutely. If this is my daughter, what would I do? The best I can with, with minimal, as minimal invasion as possible. So, yeah, I thought that was a fantastic case to finish on and show you. And, you know, there's, I, I do, I'm very, very fortunate or unfortunate, if you want to call it that. I get lots of icon cases referred to me, um, the, particularly the more complicated ones. And it, it works incredibly well. I mean, there are so many cases that we've done with such good results. And there's no question that it's, it's definitely got a, a place between, um, you know, comprehensive, uh, rehabilitative, whether that's um, ceramic, composite, or, 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 or just aeration, it's definitely got a place within our armamentarium. People ask me about my workflow for, for icon resin infiltration. So um, what I'm always going to do is I'm always going to do preoperative whitening, but I split this into mild, moderate, and severe, just for your own uh, understanding. This is someone who's probably got something like orthodontic white spots after after brackets being on there. You know that's the superficial enamel um, enamel caries demineralization. So this is probably going to require less than three cycles, and you'll only need to do resin infiltration. A moderate case is something that needs more than three cycles and may or may not need um, labial composite um, on top. And, you know, severe cases like the case I showed you is where you're going to have to use air abrasion. It's going to be more than six cycles and composite will be probably quite mandatory. So um, I want to conclude by saying hopefully you understand the relevance of photography by all of these uh, images that I've shown you. Photography plays a, a vital role in communication, but also uh, documentation and your own standards progressing. Um, I wanted to reiterate the use of rubber dam in, in restorative dentistry, but also show how you can use anterior composite anterior and posteriorly, and, and how occlusion is, is really important in all of these things. Because if, if we're not, you know, uh, monitoring the occlusion, if we're not building to the right occlusal scheme, all of these things are going to fail. And more importantly, how um, resin infiltration works in day-to-day -day practice. So um, with that said, I want to say a massive thank you to Ajay of the Akshay Patra Foundation and all of the other speakers that have had the time to, to make the time to be able to do these talks for you guys. I hope you enjoy them. Um, please support Ajay's um, charity appropriately because they're doing some fantastic work in India. Um, and uh, I like to finish on this quote, which is by Steve Jobs. The only way to do great work is love what you do. So I want to say thank you so much. Have a fantastic series of webinars and uh, I look forward to speaking to you guys soon. Thank you again.